It took one of the single greatest tragedies that can befall someone for him to find a unique voice in a sea of 20th century serialists. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about George Rockberg. George Rockberg was born in July 1918 in New Jersey and had two siblings. He was Ukrainian by ethnic heritage, and while his father labored as an upholsterer, George was always drawn to the piano, writing songs. He would always find time to write popular songs, even in his later years, although he was careful to always publish these under a pseudonym. He went to the Manus School of Music in 1939 on scholarship, and while there studied with George Zell, the famous conductor of Cleveland Orchestra fame. And while there, he took such a liking to Rochberg's music that he programmed it with some frequency when he was conducting in Cleveland. To supplement his scholarship, Rochberg played in jazz clubs throughout New York. But World War II interrupted his studies, and he served as a second lieutenant in some vicious campaigns, including Normandy, where he was wounded. But he made it through and back to the States, where he began studying at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia and from his connections there was able to continue his studies and he got his master's from the University of Philadelphia. His compositions were, from these years onward, influenced by the post-war serialist school, especially after his studies in Europe in the 1950s. He had gone to Italy on a Fulbright scholarship and while there studied with the composer Luigi della Piccola, who was one of the few composers to really take Schoenberg's 12-tone technique and make it truly lyrical and expressive. Rockberg was immediately hooked on what he saw as the frontier of music, and he began his serialist career. His studies with Della Piccola led him to believe in the merit of the serialist philosophy, even though he was always concerned with the growing divide between serialist composers and their audiences. In 1961, his son Paul was diagnosed with brain cancer, and within three years, before he was even 20, died of a brain tumor. Rockberg was so distraught that he abandoned serial techniques and pretty much quit composing for several years. The complex mathematical constructions of serialism were inadequate for him to express what he really wanted to express. That could only be done by abandoning the mathematical techniques and returning to tonality, or at the very least, free atonality, that predated the 12-tone technique and the rise of serialism. The serialists were at the height of their influence, and this was an era when you were told as a young composer that if you were very lucky, you might get to write a major third every now and then. It's hard to express just how against the grain Rockberg's turn was. Other composers would end up turning against the serialist mentality, but he was one of the first. He wasn't like some film composer either. He was an Ivy League professor, and as such, his turn against that philosophy made him the Benedict Arnold of the genre to the serialists. His first truly significant work of this anti-serialist stance came in his third string quartet. This was controversial. Serial-loving critics called it almost irrelevant. But Rothberg stood firmly by his composition, which, by the way, wasn't like super tonal either. It wasn't like he was just ripping off Mozart. He went back a lot to the complex, polyphonic, and barely sorta kinda tonal-ish writing of Béla Bartók. Perhaps the serialists didn't like it in part because it was a modernist piece that audiences actually liked, and the success of the third string quartet led to several other commissions, which led to more entries in the genre. In 1968, he began his tenure as chair of the music department at Penn, and he would stay in that role for 15 years, until he retired in 1983, when he was in his mid-sixties. The serialists still attempted to disparage his work, calling him a fraud, and saying that by turning against their philosophy, he was betraying morality. He slammed them back by calling their music hollow and meaningless. The comparison he made was the difference between abstract and non-abstract art, with serialism being abstract and non-serialism being the more concrete, the more traditional styles. He didn't necessarily seem to have much against serialist philosophy as it existed. He did, however, have a significant problem with those who said it was the only way that any composer who wanted to be taken seriously could write music. It didn't really fit what he wanted to express, and he was 
really significantly despised for it by a certain chunk of the musical establishment. He was right in that serialism can be quite limiting in the number of moods and expressive stances it can take. By the 1980s, his more traditional stance led him to being a finalist in the Pulitzer Prize for Music. But let's not kid ourselves, he was never always writing tonal music. His detractors might have made it seem like he was going back to plain chant or something, but even his non-serialist works can sometimes be very dense and not always the easiest on the ears. He did different things in different pieces, and it's hard to exactly pin him down other than him being anti-serialist after his son's death. He died in May 2005 at the age of 86. He was an extremely prolific composer who always threw all of his energy into a piece, no matter what style he was writing in. Even post-serialist, his music wasn't just simply neo-romantic. He wanted to overthrow the idea that musical progress had to be linear, and he took great pleasure at juxtaposing things that were more simple and more tonal with really crunchy dissonances. His favorite kind of music was music that spoke for itself, and as such he was against the ever more frequent practice of composers or conductors or performers talking about pieces before performing them. To Rochberg, pieces shouldn't have to require justification. You shouldn't have to have someone coming up and talking about a piece explaining how the piece is interesting. If the piece doesn't sound interesting to the audience and it doesn't make its uniqueness clear, then perhaps the Emperor had no clothes. Ever concerned with the still-present composer-audience gap, one of his books was titled The Aesthetics of Survival and analyzed all sorts of modernist music. It is one of the crown jewels of a written output that augments his productivity and composition. In his brave break from the serial mentality, we see a unique creative voice of the 20th century, initially despised for the mere crime of having his own personality. <laughs> ¶¶